the state of the state, and a debate of sorts. We talk about it next on Capital View. Welcome to Capital View, the weekly program about state government and politics and how it might just affect you. Joining me this week on Capital View is David Dahl, reporter for WTAX Radio. Welcome, Dave. Hello. And Hannah Meisel, reporter for Law 360. Welcome, Hannah. Glad to be here. The big event this week, at least uh, in, inside the Dome itself, appears to be the State of the State address by Governor Bruce Rauner. A fairly short address, it struck me uh, this time. Uh, what's new with it, Hannah? I mean, w w what did you hear out of that that is, is bears mentioning worth knowing? Anything new? Anything new? I would say no. Okay. Um, there's a lot of, you know, the governor's greatest hits. Actually, not even a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> not a big jukebox. Let's <laughs> <laughs> sure. But um, it was shorter. It was kind of vague. It wasn't even that inspiring. The state of the state, you know, just like the state of the union on the national level, mm. should be, um, you know, it should lay out a vision for uh, the state. And it doesn't really seem like the governor did that. He, mm -hmm. you know, glossed over some of accomplishments. Uh, he addressed Illinois history. Of course, we are celebrating mm -hmm. Illinois' bi bicentennial this year. But, you know, there really just wasn't very much there. No, I'm not, that was kind of my sense as well. It, I, it seemed like any quote-unquote bold new visions. I thought that uh, he brought in some folks from the Quincy Veterans Home mm -hmm. and did address the question about Legionella uh, at the uh, uh, Veterans Home. I think front on and said we're doing everything we can. We spent a lot of money uh, to to address this situation. Uh, but beyond that, uh, he he seemed to spend a lot of time saying we're poised for something new and great. But exactly what that might be and how we get there, uh, Dave. Did you hear anything specific in that? I thought it was interesting that the governor started out talking about the Me Too movement and saying that he was really going to strengthen the ethics law mm -hmm. and the process for getting complaints from start to finish. It sounded as if the turnaround time was going to be lightning quick compared to how they are now. I'm wondering how he's going to do that, how they're going to staff it, how they're going to regulate it, and how they're going to pay for it. And of course, as he's tipped before, he's going to roll back the income tax and submit a balanced budget on February 14th and get more money for schools and also uh, do more economic development. There are a lot more Amazons out there, he said, and uh, lacking in specifics but number one the state of the state is just a speech and number two uh, three years in i think uh, everybody knows each other's greatest hits and you liked the state of the state speech as much or as little as you thought you would. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's kind of like a mirror, I guess, of sorts. Well, I mean, let's talk about this, his talk about an executive order in terms of dealing with sexual harassment. Uh, did he overreach here? I mean, he said, I'm going to, and you could, without, you know, plainly saying so, he seemed to be contrasting what he, his approach with what the legislature's approach has been, which has been perhaps not the best. Uh, but I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, I'm going to do it uh, via, I'm not going to wait for any legislation. I'm going to do it myself, and we're going to do it regardless of what, all any sorts of collective bargaining agreements and, and, and things of that nature uh, might have to say. Is that going to get him in trouble down the road? I mean, can you just, by uh, governor's fiat, say, I'm going to handle things this way? Fiat's worked so well <laughs> this far. Um, no, he can't just make it happen. But mm -hmm. uh, And it'll be interesting to see if it passes legal muster. Okay. Yeah, I can see a legal challenge. But, you know, for something like this, it's... Uh, almost, you know, it's a welcome thing, even if he does overstep, because uh, the problem of sexual harassment has been um, so major and s in the spotlight for the last three, four months. And so even if it is in overreach, I think mm -hmm. people will be willing to overlook it. It's hard to be against. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no, I mean, there's really no other side to it. Right. We want, we, there's a problem and we want to solve it, but to say it's going to be on a rocket docket and uh, it's going to be, did he say 10 days or something like that? Or he, he had some kind of time frame that was quite short. Yeah, I think a number of days to respond to complaints. And yeah. I mean, th these aren't going to, these aren't going to languish. We're going to jump on. And this uh, gets the backdrop of uh, the situation with Senator Silverstein and Denise Rothheimer more unhappy than ever. Mm -hmm. And 
regretting she even got involved in it in the first place. Understandably so, if you can see the saga of it. I mean, uh, Silverstein, uh, the accused, is remains uh, in the legislature. Uh, she remains um, Denise Rothstein, uh, uh, kind of on the sidelines here. And, and I wonder almost if this issue has crested in any way, shape, or form. I mean, when it first came out, the lack of an inspector general in the legislature was a big issue. Uh, they managed to get control of that. Uh, they've got an inspector general now. Uh, at least they got some sort of a process here. Uh, they haven't necessarily really uh, uh, addressed the underlying issue, which is the inspector general for the legislature is, is somewhat uh, uh, hamstrung by a less than uh, ideal set of laws and procedures. You've got uh, still only one past or present lawmaker has been named, and that's Silverstein. Mm -hmm. And I think after reading as much as you want to read about it, I mean, it's clear they're, <laughs> they're guilty of being stupid. <laughs> and whether there's anything more than that, well, uh, Legislative Inspector General Porter said, uh, while it was conduct unbecoming, he wasn't guilty of harassment. And mm -hmm. uh, Denise Rothheimer said uh, that you know, the whole thing was rigged and mm -hmm. uh, it was just a you know, total malpractice. Do we need to name names? Uh, there's a book coming out now by a, a former... Carrie guy. Lester. Yeah, Carrie Lester, which has uh, uh, supposedly hasn't been uh, re released publicly. I think it's going to be available here in a, in a matter of days or, or weeks. Uh, but so far as we know, there's no names there. It's, just, it, it's, 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 it's uh, remembrances uh, by folks who we all know, you know, prominent uh, uh, female legislators and, 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 and public figures about their own experiences. But no, Dave did this or Bruce did that. It's come out that uh, the former Cook County State's Attorney, Anita Alvarez, is accused of turning her back on it and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just not paying attention to it. Kim Fox, the current State's Attorney, is the one who's complaining about it. And there was some individual in the State's Attorney's Office in Chicago and that uh, supposedly Alvarez knew about it and did nothing. But as far as I know, uh, Carrie's book doesn't have any uh, harassers named. But... Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, she's good. I, I think as, as she is good, as are we all. I mean, even without names, I think it's perhaps a good thing to at least see the sorts of things that are being dealt with by folks who are willing to put their names forth, as I have personal knowledge of this, but I'm not going to spill all of the beans. So well, especially speak. when, uh, you know, Springfield's been uh, summer camp for years for these lawmakers. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that that's an issue too. Are folks going to be better behaved? I mean, is Springfield less uh, a, a summer, stamp, summer camp, Woodstock, whatever you want to call it, uh, for folks who were here only part of the year, or are folks going to shape up? I mean, you would hope, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, you're still dealing with the same environment. You're still dealing with uh, the same kinds of deals that get made, um, you know, in bars or, you know, in back rooms. Um, mm -hmm. So again, you hope, of course, that mm -hmm. people are going to be more careful, more cognizant of the yeah. way that they treat women and the way that uh, women also treat each other when, you know, we whisper, like, you know, this happened to me. Yeah. But um, it's a culture change and culture <laughs> change, like we've talked about many times, it takes mm. a very long time. Yeah, uh, that's a fair point. Ship. I mean, this is a d dynamic that goes beyond government and politics, as we've all seen. I mean, restaurants, uh, the m uh, entertainment industry, uh, f uh, auto production plants. I mean, this goes, this is a society-wide sort of thing. And so uh, it will be interesting, I think, to see how this shakes out. I mean, the next scandal, and there always is a next <laughs> scandal. We'll see how that one gets handled. Well, there's so many people out there that don't have the, you know, presence of mind to think, would I want my sister or my daughter to be treated this way? Maybe I'll think twice about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are always going to be people like that who uh, do not take that into consideration mm -hmm. and just uh, use that kind of judgment. Yeah. Just moving on a bit from the secret, or excuse me, the uh, state of the state address and sexual harassment, the day of the uh, governor's address, uh, the legislature vetoed. Uh, and a mandatory veto uh, by Governor Rauner having to do with education funding. It was a technical, the bill was a technical correction to uh, a substantive bill which had passed last, uh, uh, summer. La last summer uh, that, that did do a, f a fairly uh, significant overhaul of, of funding of education of the state. Now Rauner wanted to tack more schools on that could private get uh, schools, to yeah. private schools to get tax credits and he was rebuffed. Uh, the, the legislature overrode his veto and with some extra p uh, votes to spare in both chambers. Uh, these were not, I thought curiously, uh, Jeannie Ives voted with the governor on this one, but uh, not, clearly not all Republicans in the House did. Passed unanimously in the House the first time, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that's interesting
interesting is that the governor, as someone put it, uh, made a compromise with himself, with his own administration and uh, ISBE to uh, resolve the problem and thus make the veto unnecessary uh, as it was. Okay. Do you think, that was the General Assembly in any way, shape, or form trying to send around or a message on this uh, override that it came on the day his, of his State of the State address, or is this just a coinky dink Yeah, we didn't get here by believing in Quincy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it's also important to note this is now the second time that the legislature has uh, gone, you know, taken his veto and ignored it, basically. Um, well, third time if we take the budget well, and right. if we, get, if we take the debt transfer. Specif yeah. Specifically on education. Okay, I mean, yeah. we remember last uh, August, you know, he took the bill and he uh, scratched a whole lot of it out and he wrote some new stuff and he sent it back to lawmakers and they were like, no, <laughs> uh, don't think so. And, you know, and this is another just another one of the long, you know, we also mentioned the budget that's huge last summer and the Debt Transparency Act. He is getting beat up by the legislature and, you know, a lot of in his own party. In fact, uh, this week, you know, it's not just that there is Jeannie Ives who is mounting a challenge against him and uh, beating up him up in Tribune editorial board debates or what have you. But it's also, uh, you know, quite a few very public defectors. For example, um, Representative uh, John Cabello, he's mm -hmm. from way up north um, by the Wisconsin state line. He called for Governor Rautner to resign mm -hmm. yesterday. Yep. Uh, Jeannie Ives, after the governor's speech, uh, she pounded him yet again saying, um, you know, he, he adopted these liberal progressive <coughs> ideals and you know that's another one the abortion bill that House he 40, right he had vowed to um veto but then he ended up signing you know there's so there's so many breaks in trust mm -hmm. um you know we, we remember when he was first in office and for mm -hmm. several years mm -hmm. lots of republicans were totally willing to take arrows for him but not so much anymore because they feel abandoned by him. I think this is worth uh, quoting, I think, at some length here, and so I will quote, I know Speaker Madigan extremely well, extremely well. We've had many meals together. We've talked for hours together. We've played golf together. I know him very well. This is what Governor Bruce Rauner said this past week during a session with the Ed Board of the Chicago Tribune. Does anybody believe that? No. I didn't even know Madigan golf. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the height difference alone would be a very interesting sight on the golf course. No, but this is the same session which you called McCrook. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no, I mean they haven't met um, in a long time. Uh, we also remember that all four legislative leaders have not met in months and months, maybe even a year again mm -hmm. now. And um, no, no one believes that they know Good. each other very well, and that is definitely a part of their uh, unwillingness to compromise. I mm -hmm. mean, lots of uh, governors and Michael Madigan's before him uh, mm -hmm. were able to compromise because at least they did have some uh, personal kind of relationship or at least a working business mm -hmm. relationship, but there is no relationship mm -hmm. here. Well, I mean, and this is continuing, I think, something that's happened with Mr. Rauner since Election Day, or perhaps even before. Uh, infamously, uh, when he was first elected, he said, I've just gotten off the phone with John Cullerton and Mike Madigan, and we've spoken about the results of the election. And it turned out, apparently, not to be true. Uh, Mr. Madigan uh, infamously doesn't have a cell phone. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you've got that. You've got, uh, the uh, well, most recently also, not most recently, we've had this thing with, uh, with the editorial board of, of the Chicago Tribune, but uh, I have all my finances in a blind trust. I don't talk about business. Uh, I don't have no idea about my business dealings. When it turns out, in fact, he met with a, a former business partner, as the business partner said, when the business partner said it was going to happen. It's a hard pill, uh, truth pill, I think, for folks to swallow to believe. The meeting the, was on the back porch. Of meeting on the back porch of the governor's mansion. And you've also got, uh, he, on House Bill 40, uh, that's uh, perhaps the thing that may well have propelled uh, Jeannie Ives uh, into, into the race, where he, uh, at least privately, made assurances uh, by a number of sources saying, I'm going to veto this one. This ain't going to pass. I'm not going to sign it. Uh, it's, uh, he had suggested perhaps an amendatory veto. When he was asked about that point blank uh, in the uh, Chicago Tribune editorial board, uh, meeting this Monday, he danced. He was asked directly, did you lie to the Cardinal? Chicago. 
and he said, well, I kind of talked about an mandatory veto, but I got to do what, you know, I believe in my heart, and, I, and, and, and so we've got a trust issue with this governor. Does that matter with voters, or is just, this just something that uh, other politicians care about? You know, I think it does matter. Um, you know, we've seen on other levels that it doesn't. Um, you know, for example, President Trump, he's been caught. He can in say whatever he wants. Many, often, yeah, often does. It's, it seems like he's passed some sort of threshold and he's way beyond it. Mm -hmm. I do think that the governor's repeated, um, you know, he says one thing and then later it's found he has actually done another. I do think that that has been starting to ding him. But, you know, it's been almost four years and it didn't start to come out until the latter part of his first term, I would say. With the Sanctuary Cities and House Bill 40, I think, maybe throwing some gasoline on that fire? Yeah, definitely, definitely, because okay. those are two things that uh, the conservative base hold very dear. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to go back on your word for those types of things, it just not, does not look good. The well, pile of things we're being asked to forgive is growing higher. Mm -hmm. Sure. But the governor could still afford excellent commercials. <laughs> well, I mean, it's one thing, I guess, and maybe it's just me talking, it's one thing to stare on the television cameras, look right at the television cameras, and say, I am not a crook, and it turns out that you are. And that ends up with you getting tossed out of office or for being forced to resign. Um, there's white lies. Uh, and these uh, fibs that Governor Rauner has been has been accused of telling the and Swedish grandparents, the Swedish grandparents, mm -hmm. an excellent one. Uh, or anybody but his grandparents going to be mad about that? Uh, you know, some of these things. The uh, back porch meeting, I think, uh, on the governor's mansion. How do you distill that into a thirty-second spot? Uh, uh, Easy with a picture of the governor's mansion. Okay, the governor's mansion, the people's house, mm -hmm. a house. Yeah, well, I, I'm not going to give my advice away for free. <laughs> <laughs> any, of the campaigns, any of the campaigns can contact me. Yeah, that's pretty expensive advice. Was it dave.doll at wtx.com? Something or like that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Well, I mean, this, this meeting uh, uh, with the editorial board of the Chicago Tribune on Monday is likely going to be the uh, only time we're going to see Ives and Rauner going head to head. And by all accounts, and uh, I've watched a good part of it, I confess not all of it, she killed him. I mean, it, it wasn't even close. I mean, she seemed in command of her facts. Uh, she, uh, 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 she looked, mu frankly, much more like a governor or a person who's, 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 who's in charge and intelligent than the governor did. Uh, you know, is that going to get her anywhere? I mean, she's, she's gotten, uh, I think, now nine endorsements from city and legislators. She got a uh, $500,000 contribution uh, within the past week or so from a former uh, Rauner supporter. So, you know, she's gaining some traction. Is it enough to put her over the top or is this just doomed from the beginning? Well, she's, she's definitely quite a firebrand. She is uh, poised. She's very smart. Mm -hmm. And like you said, she does have uh, command of the facts. Um, you know, but it is Illinois at the end mm -hmm. of the day, and her ultra-conservative views don't play well with a lot mm -hmm. of the state. Mm -hmm. um, so while it may be, um, mm -hmm. you know, good for her on a personal political level to, you know, beat down Rauner, it's not going to land her in the governor's mansion at any time soon, I don't think. As we say in the radio business, there's not enough available cum. The people that are on the right that would identify the most and the best with Jeannie Ives, there aren't enough of those people in Illinois mm -hmm. to make a difference in the general election mm -hmm. and maybe not in the primary. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people in Illinois still uh, really like Bruce Rauner as governor and he very, mel very well may be sworn in again. Well, if so many people like him, why aren't uh, GOP uh, uh, candidates or, or office holders? I mean, he hasn't got a big long line of endorsements from folks like Rodney Davis and, and folks that hold uh, that are in Congress from the, from the Republican Party. Why not? Are they are they afraid of alienating their own base? I mean, are they going to come around after the primary if uh, Rauner Rauner uh, succeeds in, in beating Ives? I mean, what what seems to explain this? He, we really don't want much to do with you, Mr. Rauner, uh, uh, at least from the most prominent Republicans this time around. I hadn't really thought about that, but I'm pretty sure that the uh, two top leaders in the legislature, uh, Durkin in the House, Brady in the Senate, mm -hmm. uh, they're both with him. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, I asked our two local uh, members of the House, uh, Tim Butler and Sir Wojcicki Menes, they're both with him. Okay. And you don't necessarily need endorsements so much as you need votes. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, there are an awful lot of people in Illinois 
that probably have not had their voice heard. Okay. Oh and yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. people still relate to him. They still mm -hmm. relate to his story. They still relate to all the things that he has said he wants to do from the beginning. You know, he's still very good with, mm -hmm you know, going out and meeting voters. Mm -hmm. He's incredibly good at shaking hands and listening. And so there are still, and I, I don't think that you need a lot of endorsements at this point okay. with, um, you know, when you're just facing someone who, yes, she is obviously quite strong in her own right, mm -hmm. but she's probably not going to win the nomination. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he's fine without the endorsements for right now. I mean, there's, there's the beer question, uh, which is, you know, which candidate would you rather sit down and have a beer with? And George W. Bush, I think, was infamous for that. Well, we don't think he's really necessarily the smartest guy in the race, but gosh darn it, he's the most amiable, and so that's who I'm going to go with. Is, uh, here we have a governor who uh, polls seem to show he's not very popular um, amongst the populace. So he's more popular than Mike Madigan, but uh, so are a lot of folks. Uh, can he, you know, is he going to have to rely on, this, on the power of his personality to get through this? And does he have a personality that's going to be enough to pull him through? Well, uh, like I said, he is good at talking to voters for short times. You can tell that he, especially on long days, mm -hmm. um, you know, he gets worn out and you can tell that he has a couple like pat answers. Yeah. Um, but a couple? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, do, does, do people want to have a beer with him? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he, uh, you know that he endorses... Um, Oh no, what's his beer brand? Stag. Stag, of course, sorry. Um, he endorsed Stag? Well, he, That's what he, drinks he, always, downtown. he always orders a Stag when he's at a bar. So, you know, at least. Unless he, he's at Obed's and Isaac's. Right. But that's oh, good. yeah. But he, he, he does play the part. And, mm. like, but, but is he amiable? You know, would someone want to spend an extended time with him? Probably not. But he's not going <laughs> to allow that in the first place. So. Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, during short periods of time, he, he sticks, he, he's very good at sticking on script. And that was one thing I think that didn't work well against the Chicago when he was before the Ed board, because they'd heard all this stuff. Uh -huh. You know, they're not just, they're, they're ready with some follow ups. They've heard all those things. They and interrupted so him. They didn't ask the questions that he gets asked in mm -hmm. some of the far-flung parts of the state, like, Governor, why are you so awesome? <laughs> there was none of that in that session. Let's talk a bit. There's uh, obviously more than just uh, the uh, GOP race for the governorship. There's also the, re uh, the Democratic side. And we've seen news this week that uh, almost seemed like you kind of knew it in some sense, but you didn't really know it for sure, and that is Daniel Biss according to polls done by both, uh, I believe, the Pritzker campaign and one done independently, show that Biss is now a solid second uh, against uh, J.B. Pritzker uh, and uh, with uh, Chris Kennedy pulling up third here. Is that a surprise? Is anybody, should anybody be surprised by those numbers? Now are we counting undecided? Uh, undecided, actually, under, I stand corrected, undecided in a landslide at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, go ahead. I mean... Am I surprised when I think of just like the mechanics of how cam campaigns are supposed to work <laughs> when you think about money? Sure. But um, personality wise, I mean, uh, Senator Best has a pretty, uh, you know, he has formulated his message that he's just a regular guy mm -hmm. um, raising a family. A regular guy from MIT who lives well, in Evanston. Okay. <laughs> that brand of regular. Okay, that brand you of know? regular. But, um, you know, Chris Kennedy for, you know, all Not the political guy. pedigree that he has <laughs> and the work that he does with Merchandise Mart yeah. and the, uh, you know, charity work that he does for food insecurity. Yeah. Uh, he's still not that great at, you know, the same kind of thing that Rauner at least has um, practice at is, you know, going out and meeting voters. And uh, he's not that great with reporters, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think Dan Biss is uh, surging for those reasons, but also huge reason, at least in my opinion, I think that J.B. Pritzker getting hit from the Rauner campaign, um, tying him to uh, Bogoyevich, that is really affecting him. Sure. And uh, yeah. like he might be the most viable non-millionaire candidate. <laughs> 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 but or I, I was going to say billionaire, but you're right. It's, it's, it, we're still the M level. Well, what kind of, uh, I interrupted you. Uh, well, I mean, like we've talked about on this program many times before, the Blagojevich shadow uh, is very, very long, and it'll be around for a long time. Oh, sure. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we look back and folks do this commonly, but Blagojevich was able to, to really end uh, uh, Judy Bartopinka's campaign almost before it began with these infamous videos of her dancing the polka with yeah. George Ryan. This is more damning. I mean, at least it, it's one thing to dance with somebody at, at the state fair. It's another thing entirely to, to, to talk with somebody who you know is under federal investigation or should know and appear to be groveling almost. To somebody and like uh, Pritzker isn't handling it well at all. And no. at the forum they had in uh, Chicago, uh, he still is sticking with the, well, I wasn't accused of wrongdoing and I didn't break any laws. And I think he's handling, again, free advice. I, not that he... Well, fair enough. But call well, me, he's handling it all wrong. I, I almost wonder this. I mean, uh, Blagojevich dangled the attorney general out at him, which is a much more powerful post when you think about it in terms of what the possibilities are, how it affects real people's lives than the treasurer's office. And Pritzker said, nah, I don't want to be AG. I want to be treasurer. What does that say about J.B. Pritzker? Well, I don't pretend to be in his head, um, mm -hmm. but attorney general, it's in Illinois, it's a really huge mm -hmm. position. You're responsible for a lot. Mm -hmm. You, um, you know, there's a lot of consumer issues. Mm -hmm. You know, you advocate for you know, people who are not like you. So maybe he just wasn't comfortable with that. Maybe he's just more comfortable in the financial world because part of the job of treasurer is to make sure that state investments are in the right places, getting the right interest rates, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. You look at all the competition for the state treasurer's post now. Nothing. Yeah. And so, you know, that, 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 that to me, I mean, I, rightly or wrongly, it's why does somebody want to be treasurer when somebody says, well, how would you feel about being attorney general? Nah, don't want to do it. Um, and again, the polls are, go are showing that these ads appear perhaps to have genuinely hurt Pritzker. Uh, any chance, any chance at all, that Kennedy, again, uh, undecided is winning at this point in time, might we see an alliance at all between Kennedy and Biss saying, you know what, together we can beat Pritzker, we're going to just go, one of us is going to drop out and go ahead. Any chance? I don't know about that, but I think it's interesting that we're talking about two really rich guys in the race and Kennedy's not one of them. <laughs> um, but I think uh, Biss is... Well, Biss uh, isn't rich, but... He isn't yeah. rich, but he's proven to be a good candidate, yeah. a very good candidate. I don't know how many votes he's going to get, but I think he's handling it uh, mostly well after the misstep with the uh, uh, lieutenant governor candidate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Biss is in it to uh, uh, be at the finish line. I'm not sure what Kennedy's future yeah. is. The breakdown we should mention that I forgot to mention was uh, Biss is doing better in the Chicago suburbs, mm -hmm. not yeah. as well as Pritzker is yeah. still downstate. Yeah, and we're almost out of time. One thing I do want to point out is Biss also did take the arrow saying, I voted wrong on the pension thing. Uh, and that, whether he's going to pay for that or not, or not, it was going to be brought up anyway. Mm -hmm. But with that, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week on Capitol View.